All right, thank you guys. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, I'm going to talk about bandit algorithms, uh, which is a topic I've been busy with, believe it or not, for more than 10 years. Uh, it's hard to believe, but time's uh, flying by very quickly. And uh, a very good reason to give this talk is because uh, with my colleague, Tor Latimore, who is also at DeepMind, we just finished his book, uh, which is just devoted to bandits. Okay, it's, it's doing a little bit more than bandits, but uh, there is a 600 page of awesomeness about bandits uh, in the book and related topics, uh, a lot of cool stuff. And uh, it's free, uh, it's available online, it will always be available online. It's going to be printed by Cambridge University Press, uh, hopefully soonish, but we have to still work a little bit more on the book. Um, but uh, no more chapters, no more extra writing, it's just like publishing. Anyways, uh, so the book uh, actually covers much more than I will be able to cover today. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I will try to give you a glimpse into what this research about bandits is about. Um, so here's the brief contents of the talk. Uh, so I start off uh, with uh, just talking about the, the classic finite and bandit case, the stochastic case. Uh, Adam briefly mentioned this, uh, this is like the the little brother of uh, reinforcement learning, baby reinforcement learning, you could think about it like that. And uh, this will give us a reason to, uh, to think about how to uh, think about setting up learning problems, uh, how algorithms and uh, problem definitions relate to each other. And what's really special about bandits is that this gives, uh, bandits give us the a very good opportunity to be uh, to dive deeply into this. Uh, and uh, then we continue uh, with finite and bandits. I'm going to talk about the so-called adversarial case, uh, which uh, we will see is not so adversarial, uh, so we can still have a learning algorithm that performs pretty well in that case. Uh, and then we move on and we try to see whether we can make things a little bit more practical uh, by considering bandits with a large number of actions. And uh, if you have a large number of actions, turns out you better introduce some additional structure, additional bias. And uh, here I'm going to talk about mostly the linear case, or I think solely exclusively linear case, uh, related to contextual bandits and what if you have too many features, how can you use sparsity and so on and so forth. And then we wrap up. All right. Uh, so you have already uh, played a little bandit game, and I will have my own version, but uh, so here's just a slide to quickly remind you of uh, how bandits works. Uh, so you have K arms or actions in bandits, uh, we're calling these arms. And um, the reason is because uh, back in the old days, some psychologists ran some experiments with mice, and they wanted to generalize the was studying the learning capabilities of mice, and they wanted to generalize this to, to people, but people didn't like to run in these mazes and get the cheese. So they were thinking about how to set this up, and then they figured out that maybe it's better to set it up as if they were gambling, okay? So the human experiment was run with these uh, slot machines, and they could all, people really loved it because they could only win more or less. It was just that they were paying with their time. Uh, so that's the history, like why bandits has this strange terminology that you are pulling arms, okay? But those are really actions that you're taking, and if you take an action, uh, so in the classic stochastic case, there is an underlying uh, distribution for each of the actions, and a payoff is generated at random from the distribution. Now the learner, uh, the person who is trying these different actions, or agent or whatnot, doesn't know about this distribution, doesn't know the dis that the distributions exist, but they don't know what the distribution is, okay? And uh, they want to maximize their total reward, and the total reward under uh, mild conditions is very close to the total expected reward. So let's just think about trying to maximize total expected reward. How can we do that? Well, we should pull always the arm with the highest mean underlying the unknown distribution but since we don't know the distribution, we have to keep trying. 
So there is a little trial and error involved. So the game could work like this, which is shown in this table. Uh, so you have these three arms, and these are the rounds, so this is kind of time. And in the first round, you're going to try arm one. Okay, why not? Like arm one has the smallest index. And then what you see is that you get a payoff of zero. So let's say uh, this is the simplest setting, binary payoff, zero, one, binary payoffs. Uh, and uh, what's special here is that you got information in this time slot about ARM1, but you didn't get any information about ARM2 or ARM3. So in a way, you have to, for each of the time slots, decide about which ARM you want to get information about, okay? But the other thing that you care, you actually don't care per se uh, about the information that much. You care mostly about collecting the most reward, but of course, at the beginning, if you have no information, you have to somehow care more about the information until you're kind of confident enough, and then you can go with maybe the best choice uh, that uh, you think is uh, best based on the statistics you collected so far. So, and then for the next time step, maybe uh, they, uh, you, you, can, you can try ARM2 and then ARM3 because you didn't have any information about those. And then you go back to ARM1, and then now you are in this, in this situation, and you have to decide uh, which ARM to pull next. So you are uncertain about the actual mean rewards of the actions, okay? And because of that uncertainty, like you have to kind of uh, figure out uh, which way to go, and you have to balance uh, the need to gain information uh, with the need to gain reward in a principled way. So the agent's goal or, or the learner's goal is going to be uh, to maximize the reward. Maybe there are n rounds. Uh, is this clear? Yes. Half correct. We don't actually want to learn the probability distributions. We want to learn enough about the probability distributions so that we can make optimal decisions. But you're absolutely right. They're underlying hidden probability distributions. So in this case, let's say I confine the rewards to be binary. So then there is a single parameter that tells me what is the probability that I, the next pool is going to give me a reward of one. Okay? All right. Uh, so this is... Uh, Believe or not, even this very silly problem could have uh, applications, does have applications. Like you can imagine that the arm pools are different medical interventions, like uh, different dose, different drug, and patients arrive in a sequential fashion, and the whole situation is stochastic, so randomly uh, arriving patients, uh, no patterns in, in, in the way the patients arrive. And then, of course, you want to save the most lives. So that, let's say in this case, it's, it could be very extreme, like the patient either, you know, survives or maybe, you know, like you improve uh, their health state or, or, or not. And then you want to do the best possible. So it's like la running ethical clinical, running clinical trials in ethical fashion. So this is one of the original motivations why people studied bandits. Uh, but uh, in modern, you know, like um, days, uh, one of the most prevalent application is uh, in recommendation systems when, you know, users arrive at a website and you can recommend one of the three books and if someone buys a book, then you get a reward of one. You can make it more complicated, of course, it could be like you have to store the book and like there is a storage cost and uh, different books cost a uh, different amount and so on and so forth. Uh, but the idea is the same. Um, and finally, you can set the price uh, for things. So the dynamic price selection, uh, you can choose different prices when you are pricing an item. So you're selling a single book here, and you choose different prices. But it's the same problem. And the list goes on and on. Okay. So uh, you already seen some demo, but I also wanted to show you some, some demo. Let, let's see whether this works. Right, so this is a simulator that my colleague Tor has written. Uh, you see it? No? All right, okay. I think if I exit full screen. Um, okay. 
Hmm. It's not as seamless as I expected it to be. All right. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so what you see in this case, I, I can uh, click on display, is that uh, it's the Bernoulli case. So there are two arms. You could set the number of arms to be uh, something bigger, but two arms is just good enough for us. And then you can try the two arms by uh, clicking on these buttons. You could also try this, but uh, I guess maybe later on you can uh, experiment with it a little bit. Uh, it's kind of fun. And you see these dotted lines? They, they correspond to the means of the payoff. So the P parameter of the Bernoulli distribution for the blue arm, it's like here, and, and for the orange arm, it's like that. And then in each time step, uh, when you're pushing one of the buttons, then you can see how um, the mean and the confidence intervals actually move. It's actually showing you confidence intervals in this case. If I turn off the display, now I can uh, generate a new data uh, or even new problem. Uh, then we can experiment a little bit. I'm pressing a few times uh, blue and then gold and uh, the number of cones, uh, of how many times I pressed each of them are shown there. And you can see that they're pretty close to each other. So we kind of like in a tight spot deciding which arm to choose. So maybe you not choose uh, the blue one to verify whether it's, it's better than the other one. It seems it's not doing much better. So maybe go with the orange one. And it shows us a total reward. And if you turn on the display, then you can see the trues, the underlying true means. And in this case, we were right. But I can generate a bunch of new problems. And if I generate some problem where the two means are really close to each other, then I will have a really hard time because I can start with a bad few initial pulls. And then maybe the blue is going to look worse initially. So the mean is 0 0.13 right now for the blue. I try the, the, the range and the orange looks better, right? So at this stage, if I decided I go with the orange, I would be bad because I would forever choose the orange. I would lose the difference between the two, the means of the two arms. Yes? Do I mean what? That's the P parameter of the bad, bad only P parameter. Okay, fair enough. Um, all right. So any questions? Any other questions for this? Yes. What is the regret? Uh, so the regret, we're going to talk more about it. But the regret is how much I pay when I tried. I, I pulled the blue arm eight times. The orange arm, I pulled 10 times. I get my total reward. And that could be less then the total reward that I could have gotten if I pulled the optimal arm, in this case, the blue arm, from the beginning of time, always. Okay, so that's how much I lose compared to someone uh, who actually knows what to do in this specific instance. So that's another way of uh, showing how well you're doing. If your regret is negative, you're doing better, you're kind of lucky than uh, an optimal strategy. And if your regret is big, that's a bad thing. So this is actually cost. All right, and, and we do have these algorithms and, and we're gonna talk a little bit about them and they pull the arms and so, so forth. Uh, so we'll come back to this uh, demonstration later. All right. Okay, so let's move on. So, so yeah. It's a little problem, so why should we care about this? As I already alluded to, uh, the main reason to care about this is because uh, this is a simplified version of reinforcement learning that allows us to study the explore, exploit aspects of reinforcement learning without uh, being blocked down by complications like what Adam mentioned, uh, the deadly triad and other things that come together with reinforcement learning. Okay, so uh, sometimes if uh, some problem uh, doesn't have a very well-defined or established solution, 
It is very smart to simplify the problem to the extent that you can just study one aspect of the problem on its own, and bandits are really uh, good for this, all right? So that's, uh, to me, uh, a big reason. Another big reason is because it's just so much fun, because it's such a simple setting, and still it's quite rich, as I'm hope, I hope I'll be able to convince you. Um, and also it has some applications. All right, so the, these are the applications. Uh, I already talked about a few, and if you want, we can talk about other applications as well, but let's just move on. Um, so this is a little bit more formal introduction. Uh, so we have this uh, uh, K-arm stochastic bandits. Uh, so you have payoff distributions like shown here with blue, green, and, and red, which are Gaussians, which are unknown, corresponding to different arms. Here you have three arms, so K is equal to, oops. K is equal to three. In this case, the agent's uh, goal is to maximize the total reward, which is the same as minimizing the regret. So let's be a little bit more firm. So the means of the arms, I'm going to denote them by mu1, mu2, mu3, and if there were k actions or k arms, then we would continue after mu of k, all right? The arm that has the highest payoff has a mean of the maximum of the mu of k over all possible k's, all right? Let's say mu of i, where i is between one and k, and the regret of the player is going to be defined how? After n rounds, so it depends on the... So maximizing the total reward is the same as minimizing the regret. So why do we care about the regret and not maximizing the, the total reward? And why do we use this language? Uh, do you want to see another thing or the same schematic? Theory. Uh, so the reason is, is because regret makes different bandit differences easier to compare. So notice that if I add n to the mean reward, jumping around yes okay all right all right um, so that's that's why we care about the regret that's one of the reasons we care about the regret all right so uh, regret fine um, so we talked about that the re regret uh, in general you expect the expected is, is going to be non-negative right you can't do better than optimal strategy on expectation 
the random regret when you didn't have the expectation, you could be lucky with some of the rewards, you could do better, but the expected regret is definitely going to be non-negative in these problems. And then the question is, how fast does it grow? The first step, regret, we expect it to, to decay to zero, and when that happens, then we see that learning happens. That means that we are converging in terms of the reward that we collect to how much reward the optimal strategy would collect, right? So if I divide both sides here of the regret definition by n, I can cross out this n, I can divide this by n, then uh, we see that this converges to zero if and only if the average reward per time step that I collect, my agent collects, converges to new star, which is the best possible thing, right? So we want the average per time, per time step regret to converge to zero, okay? So that means that we want, another way of saying this is that we want sublinear regret. So Rn divided by n should converge to zero, okay? Typical results that you're gonna see is that uh, Rn scales with square root n, for example. So if Rn is like square root n, then of course Rn divided by n is one over root n, and that happily converges to zero, right? If you get any other polynomial growth, like n to the p, where p is smaller than one, you're still fine. The regret is never going to be bigger, by, it's not never going to uh, grow faster than n, by the way, because even if the agent's not doing anything, it cannot grow faster than linear. So linear scaling of the regret is kind of the, like the worst thing that can happen to it. <coughs> Any questions? Right, so that's the random regret. If I don't put the expectation over there, then I can start in a lucky way, and maybe for a suboptimal arm, or even for an optimal arm, I always get a reward of one. Whereas what I'm comparing to, that's like new star, that's the expected reward for, uh, for the arm, for the best arm. of tries. Uh, with things go on, sometimes you know in ahead of time how many patients you're gonna see, sometimes you just like, as a function of n, you want this to converge to uh, Rn divided by n, you want it to converge to zero as fast as possible. Uh, the variance of the regret is another good question. If you take the random regret, then you want to control the variance as well, because if you're not controlling the variance, the variance can bite you, then you might uh, have a very risky strategy. Not going to talk much about it, but there is much to talk about that. Yes. Question? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the simplest setting when uh, someone uh, gives you an N, it's Someone tells you n equals 100. A more complicated setting is the so-called anytime setting when you don't know which n you're gonna be stopped. And for any n, you want to get the smallest possible regret. And then you can ask whether you have to significantly change the strategies uh, from one setting to the next. And those are very good questions, yes. How do you choose the reward function? I'm not choosing the reward function. The reward function is given to me. Uh, the reward function would, uh, the reward distributions would be the, the unknown quantities that are defined by the environment. In an application though, okay, so you can think about that when you try to apply bandits, then you may need to choose reward functions or rewards. Uh, so I can't completely ditch this question, but here I'm not really concerned with that. Uh, in applications, that could be a really tough call uh, because sometimes it's not so obvious that the thing that you want to optimize is something you can measure right away and then you introduce surrogate rewards and then if you are optimizing your surrogate reward, it may or may not lead to the desired behavior and that's a good uh, topic on its own. All right, whoa, okay.
Yes. Uh, so you could, you could try to think the simplest way would be that I want to control a percentile or quantile, upper quantile of the regret. That means that I'm risk averse. Yes. Yeah. They are absolutely stationary right now. That means that the distributions don't change over time. And I'm going to exploit this for a while. Uh, the nice lesson about these bandits is that if you work out strategies for the stationary case, they are, they are kind of give you hints about what to do in the non-stationary case. There are of course complications. You have to do things a little bit differently, but some of the basic lessons remain the same. Ah, I see, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, so here it, these agents don't have any feelings. They don't have biology. <laughs> so we're kind of lucky, <laughs> but you're right. If you would pose this problem for a human, they would react differently, uh, but we don't really are getting into that. I will mention human learning a little bit later in connection to this, but yeah, like that's, that's a different, uh, aspect of the problem. If you would pose bandit problems to humans, you have to be super careful with this. Yes. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, I do love the questions, uh, but we have a few things to cover here. Okay, um, so uh, in Adam's talk, we have already heard about epsilon greedy, right? So epsilon greedy explores with a positive probability and uh, exploits otherwise. Is this a good strategy? Well, I told you that if you have linear bandit or lin <laughs> if you have linear regret, that that's pretty good. If you think about this, on every trial with epsilon probability, uh, almost epsilon probability, the uh, agent is going to choose a suboptimal action. And it's kind of like just not learning uh, from its experience of like how not to do this. So ideally you want to dis decay this epsilon because over time this accumulates to quite a big of a cost, right? So you're kind of paying a cost of epsilon time, like proportional to epsilon and uh, you want to decay this epsilon. So the next simplest thing is when you're decaying epsilon over time, uh, but when you're decaying epsilon over time, then maybe uh, you can uh, also think about this alternate strategy, which kind of would, like there, there the idea is that you want to learn for a while, and then after that, you switch to exploitation. You just use the knowledge that you collected and act according to that, according to what seems to be the best uh, at its face value. So you would just take the empirical means uh, for all the arms, for the payouts, based on the statistics collected so far, you would act greedily with respect to that, okay? So uh, a strategy like that is called the explored and uh, commit strategy. And the explored and commit strategy is maybe uh, a little bit better than this epsilon greedy with decaying exploration. Um, and uh, here I plotted uh, the way this strategy behaves is a function of uh, what we call the gap. So if you have just two actions, so this is for the two action case. So k equals to two. Then there is the optimal uh, arm or optimal action and there is the suboptimal action. And every time you choose the suboptimal action, you pay an expectation, the difference between the payoffs of these two uh, to uh, arms, so this is this delta. So delta in this case is mu two minus mu one because uh, mu two is bigger than mu one. And uh, as a function of the gap, like this, this gives you a nice parametrization of all the Bernoulli bandits. You can change the gap between zero and one and you get all two arms Bernoulli bandits. Why, why, keep, why do I keep repeating this Bernoulli? Bernoulli is the distribution underlying the payoff, so it's like zero ones uh, 
that you see all the time, the binary uh, distributions or binary pre-ups. And um, here I'm plotting the expected regret after a certain number of trials, I think it's like a thousand. So the horizon is, uh, I believe, a thousand. So that's n. And as a function of the delta, so this is delta, I show the expected regret. So smaller numbers are better. And I show this for different values of m. So m is this parameter of the argotum after which it switches to exploitation, okay? So the way the argotum works is that it say that, hey, I have this horizon of n, and for m steps, let's just explore. So that means you plot the Clairvaux means wrong in one of the actions or doing the wrong one of these actions between the two lines that you think that the first step is first step is first step is second step. So each time it tries and will repeat n uh, because you have two uh, uh, directions. And then after that, it switch to exploitation. Okay. And this. I'm just going to give you some slack here. That'll be why I sort of wrote that. Yeah, it should be better. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so the first thing is that if you have a bigger gap, then you see that the regret decays. So why is that? Regrets are smaller generally, except for when m equals 100. So, so for this small number, so when, uh, when we uh, explore for a little while and then after that we switch to uh, exploitation, then generally for, for these curves, m equals 25 and 50, maybe even for uh, 75, no, not really. But okay, for 25, definitely it's like there is this regime where you see the data increases. Um, and as the data increases, the regret decreases. So why is that? So what's the intuition? What do you think? You know, this algorithm for 20 time, uh, 25 time steps, uh, it just keeps exploring. It tries each action 12 times, let's say. And after that, it goes with the best. I know you think about, okay, yes? That's right. Uh, so you know, like the outcomes are random. Every time uh, you would run an experiment, you would see different rewards. But if the gap between the payoffs is bigger, then the chance that you're gonna find the which of the two arms is the optimal arm based on just so many trials, 12 trials, is higher, right? If uh, the gap is really large, then this chance goes up. But if the gap is large, and if you make a mistake, then you also pay. So that's why uh, on these graphs, you see that this, uh, these graphs are increasing here, right? And, and here, a little bit there. So this is going to depend on, on how big is the horizon, right? Like if the horizon <coughs> is uh, smaller, then maybe altogether it doesn't matter that you're making a mistake. But if you make a mistake and the horizon goes to infinity, then that has a high price, okay? But here we have a fixed horizon. So we kind of understand how a very large delta is making things first maybe a little bit easier and then it makes things a little bit harder in terms of the regret for this uh, or worse, uh, better and, and worse, yes. I will talk, we, okay, this, this optimal M is just based on like doing some calculations that the algorithm wouldn't be able to do, we'll come to that. 
It is just like, if I knew uh, the data, what would be the optimal amp to choose for each instance? So that's kind of like the best that you could possibly hope is this type of ergotum. Uh, it's not a feasible ergotum, that optimal amp, okay? Uh, so for a very small data, on the other hand, what happens? So why do we see that the regret decays uh, for a very small data? So what happens when data is equal to zero? It doesn't matter what you choose, right? And there is some continuity going on. So if data is really close to zero, it's kind of the same thing. It doesn't really matter. So you expect these graphs to go to zero as uh, data becomes really small. All right. Okay, so this is uh, kind of useful. So we see uh, on one hand, okay, so I, I didn't talk about that, uh, but, but you see that like there are all these graphs and, and uh, all the graphs differ a little bit and you can imagine choosing for each of the data the best possible M and uh, it turns out that a single M is not going to be good across the whole range of problems, and we can understand why, okay? If you choose a single M, I can always choose some uh, data that makes the regret of your ergotum worse than what could be achieved uh, by some other ergotum in this family, okay? And so, uh, so one of the stories is that, okay, M depends on the bandit instance, uh, then we could treat M as a hyperparameter and, and try to tune it to some population or whatnot. Uh, but maybe it's better to try to choose M so that it, it is based, uh, the choice is based on data, like the ergotum chooses M as it goes. And that's, that's essentially what uh, we're trying to do when we're uh, designing uh, bandit ergotums. Uh, we try to design ergotums that get this golden curve. And uh, so the question is, how do you do that? Uh, if you stick to export and commit, it's kind of not so nice to do this. It's possible to do, but it's hard to generalize it to beyond two arms. You can still do it, but you lose a little bit compared to some other ideas that next I'm going to talk about. And uh, so that, so one of the stories is that, okay, like a single ergotum in this family is just not good for all the instances and maybe you need some other more principled ergotums. The other story is that not all instances are equally hard, it seems, because even for the, for the golden curve, you can see a little bump, right? It's at here in, in this, in this um, part of the curve. Uh, the regret is highest even with the best choice of M. And uh, so that might give you a little pause like, oh, is that like an inherent uh, property of the um, bandit ergotums? It turns out yes. Not all instances are equally hard. Some instances are harder. You might think about that, okay, this is just specific to the ergotum family. It turns out, this turns out not to be the case. All right, so what is this uh, better design? Uh, this is the optimism principle and we can connect here to human learning a little bit. So there is this uh, nice little book by Tali Sharat, who is at UCL, uh, who happens to talk completely independently of the bandit literature about the optimism bias of humans and how they manage uncertainty. Uh, um, and how they're optimistically making their decisions. So there is uh, some psychological evidence that this principle that I'm advocating here is also used by humans and animals as well. So what is this principle? It just says that you should act as, uh, as if you are in the nicest plausible world possible. So here the emphasis is that it should be the nicest, so that makes you optimistic. But it should also be a plausible word because otherwise you just always think that you're in the best possible foot and then like it doesn't really matter what action I take. So that doesn't make any sense. So given your data, what you have to do is that uh, 
you have all possible words that you can imagine, and then the data would eliminate some, some of these words, and amongst the rest, you want to choose the word that seems to give you the highest expected reward on the average, okay? And then you would choose that word, and then you would compute what's the optimal thing to do in that word, and then you would just follow that for a while. So that's the optimism principle. Yes, questions? I talk about it. That's the next slide. Yes. So I really like the data. I guess for for the for the for the uh, people who are in the business of doing research, it's kind of nice because they 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 do what? They are probably not talking about this. Right? Okay. So yeah, we'll come to that. But this is like a more general view of the same thing. Okay, that's a bad word. <laughs> you don't want to think that that happens. If that really happens and your agent cannot be restarted, then that's kind of like a bad situation. I don't think that any algorithm can deal with traps. If you have a word that is full of traps, then since you should be curious about the word to be able to know what to do, if you're curious, you're gonna fall into some traps so you can try to think about how to avoid traps, but that's usually based on past experience that you bring to a problem to think about like, hey, I've seen some traps before. This may look like it's a trap. So that means I'm ruling out that word as a bad word. So that kind of still confines this picture. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely not. Okay, so if you want to soften the maximum likelihood principle, which says that uh, you should think that the word is the one that makes the data maximally likely, you can soften this and then you can say that, well, you shouldn't uh, just take this single word, but you should take all those possible words or explanations for the data that make the likelihood kind of close to the maximum value, then you're absolutely right on the data. If you have a probabilistic model, then this is a very simple way to implement how to eliminate unplausible words and separate them from the plausible words. Very good. Okay, we're not making much progress with the slides, but I kind of like the questions. <laughs> All right, um, so UCB. Um, so this is how you implement optimism, okay, in bandits. So you have all these bandits, uh, all these arms, with unknown payoff distributions, and then uh, you can think about that the data gives you not only a single value of like what is the, the mean for the arm, but kind of a range for the means, right? Like what are the possible means given the data? And you can express that with confidence intervals, right? Like this is just kind of classic statistics. And then uh, what the optimism principle says is that you should think about each of the arms. So you have arm one, and arms one, arm one's uh, uh, mean is likely to be in this interval with probability, I don't know, uh, 0 0.95, okay? I just made up this number. And then you have arm two, which for which you can also draw an interval. And uh, arm two's uh, mean reward could lie in this other interval. And then the optim optimism principle says that the possible words are those where the mean, you can select one mean from one of the intervals and another mean from the other interval. You can 
consider all possible these pairs, and you should choose the pair of the means in which you could gain the most reward, which one is that? There are many solutions to this, but it surely is going to select the mean in this upper end for this arm, okay? And uh, you can select any other mean there, right? So for this pair, this word, if I act optimally in this word, the mean reward per time step is going to be maximum. Okay? And I said that once you select this word, you should choose the action according to this word. So if you select this word, which action should I choose? There is action one, and there is action two. I said you should act as if this was the true word. So it has to be action two. So I'm going to select action two. So no, notice that this is the same thing as saying that we should calculate upper confidence bounds for the means of the payoffs for each of the arms and choose the arm with the highest upper confidence bound. Okay? So this gives us this ergotum, what's called the UCB ergotum, and uh, up to constant factor, this is how it looks like. You take the empirica mean for an arm, you take how many times you have pulled that arm, so the confidence interval width is inversely proportional to the square root of that count. And you also have a log factor. So this log factor is pretty crucial that in increases with time. What this tells you, so usually in a confidence interval, you see a log one over delta there, and then you are one minus delta confident about the confidence interval. So this choice tells you that t equals one over delta, or delta equals uh, one over t. So that means that you want to be increasingly confident. The error probabilities that you allow yourself to make decrease over time. And that's pretty crucial. You, you have to do this in order to converge. So you want to be increasingly confident. It's the fine choice, like this comes from the analysis. Once you have this idea that you should have this type of ergotum, so you can analyze them, and you look at how the regret behaves, and then it wor you work out the details, and it turns out that you have to make this choice. If you would choose a fixed data, then eventually uh, that would bite you. It would come back uh, after you. So what happens if we uh, run this ergotum? Um, is shown on this graph. So this is the black curve. And you can see that the black curve very closely traces uh, the curve that we got with the optimally chosen um, M for the previous um, class of ergotums. So this seems to be doing pretty well. All right. So this is pretty cool. Uh, so with some theory that I didn't show you, okay, uh, I guess I promise I explain how optimism is going to help you to select the best possible arm. Uh, I will come back to that. But the one, one of the stories is that theory helps you to eliminate hyperparameters uh, and it gives you a simultaneously best choice for all bandit instances. And this is a good algorithm both empirically and, and theoretically. Um, and the same story uh, still applies that we see that not all instances are equally hard even for this ergotum. All right, so how does this work? So, uh, so why optimism helps in this case? Well, in order to choose a suboptimal arm, the index of that arm should ac exceed the index of the optimal arm, okay? Since these are upper confidence bounds, the index of the optimal arm is bigger than its mean. So this means that in order to choose a suboptimal arm, its index has to exceed the mean of the optimal arm. The only way you can choose a suboptimal arm is like that, okay? But it's also true that the index of the suboptimal arm is an upper bound on its uh, mean. So we can write this chain, on, chain of inequalities. So Let's say I 
is a suboptimal arm. And uh, let's call this just uh, C of i. So this is the index, u hat of i plus C of i. And uh, the only way that we can choose, uh, sorry, this arm is if uh, its index is bigger than mu star. But it's also true that mu i, if I add the confidence interval widths, it's, it's symmetric uh, to mu i, then I get something bigger than mu head of i. Okay? The confidence intervals are symmetric in this case, right? So this high probability this holds. Now, if you put together these two inequalities, what you get is that mu i plus 2c of i must be bigger than mu star. Okay? So now, you can reorder this inequality. Um, mu, I, mu star minus mu i is the gap between the mean payoffs of the two arms. It's a positive quantity because mu star is, um, is the optimal arm, so that's the highest mean. And two times square root log t over ni must be bigger than this gap. So this gives you, if you reorder it for n of i, it gives you an upper bound on n of i. And the upper bound is roughly going to be, sorry, upper bound, 1 over the difference between mu star minus mu i squared. I'm omitting the log factors, the two and so on and so forth, just reorder quickly to an i. So this, this, this tells you that if you follow this strategy, a suboptimal arm cannot be chosen more than one over the gap square times, okay? So this is how it works, right? So it works by telling you that the strategy uh, ceases to choose suboptimal arms after a while, regardless of how many times the optimal arm was chosen. You're not focusing on how many times the optimal arm is chosen, you're focusing on how many times a suboptimal arm can be chosen. And the confidence intervals, this optimism principle together with confidence intervals, tell you that this cannot happen forever. Right? So this also gives you uh, an upper bound on the regret, and it turns out that the regret, is on the next slide, is going to scale with log n over delta i for delta i uh, being the gap between mu star and mu of i, so a positive quantity for suboptimal arms. And it also scales with log n. Uh, so previously I, s I, I kind of omitted details, but you can show that the ni is at most uh, log n divided by that i squared. Okay, so that's how many times you can choose a suboptimal arm. And if you choose a suboptimal arm, how much you pay in terms of regret? You pay that i. So multiply this, both sides, by that i, and sum over all the arms, you get this expression. So that explains why you see this uh, as the upper bound on the regret uh, for UCB. And it turns out that this is by and large an optimal quantity and UCB is an optimal uh, algorithm um, in a, in a well-defined sense. You can't really improve uh, what UCB does. You can prove lower bounds that show you that no other algorithm which kind of have desi other desired uh, properties like asymptotically, uh, um, sublinearly, subpolynomially chooses uh, the optimal arm, so suboptimal arms, uh, no other algorithm can do better than this. And uh, UCB also enjoys this other bound, like uh, if the gaps are really small, you might wonder about, is it really true that the regret becomes uh, big? Well, for a fixed n, you shouldn't 
take a look at this. You should take the minimum of n times delta and, um, and this regret bond. So this is just one way of bonding the regret, but uh, another way of bonding the regret is just to say that whenever UCB selects a suboptimal arm, it only suffers at most delta uh, gap uh, regret. It can do it n times, so the, the actual upper bond on the regret is the minimum of n times delta, and this t times uh, the sum of log n over delta of i. And if you solve for what is the worst case, for the choices of the delta i's, uh, if you have an algorithm like this, you will see that the worst case is going to be when delta is uh, square root uh, k over n. So those are the hardest instances for, for these algorithms. And actually it happens that these are the hardest instances for all the other, uh, all the other type of algorithms. And if we plug this in into this uh, other quantities, so this makes the two terms roughly equal, you get this quantity, right? So that's how you get the uh, worst case uh, bond. And it turns out that this is unimprovable in general as well, yes. Sorry, if time was, it would... Oh, like the how is the index defined at time equals zero? Well, infinity, upper bound. It's like, is the upper bound on the mean, it's gonna be one, right? Yeah. So if the algebraic expression doesn't make sense, you just choose the maximum possible upper bound. Uh, and that fixes this problem. Okay. All right, so we see uh, this very peculiar property that, okay, uh, we have this ergotum, it achieves these bonds, and I, I didn't try to convince you why these bonds are unimprovable, but they are. All right, so I'm in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over this, or I, I just go really fast. Um, all right, so here, there is an interesting story of how you should be designing and choosing ergotums. And the way you should always be thinking about this is that there are all the possible problem instances that you're interested in solving. You can uh, put them on the x-axis, and then there are all the possible algorithms that you might be interested in choosing. You put them on the y-axis, and then you can score each of them, okay? And then if you score each of them, you get this big table. Higher score is a better algorithm. Uh, maybe score is the negative regret. And then you can take a worst case viewpoint and you can say that, well, what's the worst case performance of each of the ergotums? Uh, so here, this is the worst, this is the worst, this is the worst, this is the worst for each of the ergotums. And then you want to eliminate the ergotums which are the worst possible. So you eliminate this, this ergotum because it's just too bad. And of the remaining ones, uh, then you can look at, go back and look at individual instances. And you can say like, of the remaining algorithms, what's the best performance that I can get for each of the individual instances, okay? And uh, you see that amongst these three stars and four stars, four stars is better, two stars is better, and so on and so forth. So these are the best performances, and then uh, you might say that like, hey, do, can I find an algorithm that is nearly as good as the best possible per instance? And sometimes the answer is going to be yes. This is the case for this uh, Karen bandit problem. So then we say that this algorithm is instance optimal, okay? Uh, and that's, that's a very uh, lucky setting when you can find an instance optimal algorithm. Uh, sometimes that's hard, and then people start to group instances together to have themselves to think about instance optimality that way. Uh, but this uh, way of thinking about instances and ergotums and how you should choose an ergotum based on uh, all possible performance metrics is kind of like a, a very neat way of, of thinking about how to formulate your problems. We'll come back to this uh, later. All right, I'm gonna skip. All right. Um, but of course, uh, everything depends on how you choose uh, the set of instances. So here, 
Uh, I was mostly talking about Bernoulli bandits, or you could choose about Gaussian bandits, uh, or you could think about Ga Gaussian bandits where the payoffs are Gaussian. Uh, but uh, there are so many different choices. If you make the distributions habitat, then you have to change the design of the algorithms and the results are going to change. If you make the class bigger in certain ways, then you have to change the algorithms. And then, so you might think that, like, let's choose the largest possible class, but that might render the problem just impossible, so that might not work. Or you might think about, let's choose the smallest possible class, but then you have to be careful so that the instance that you, or the instances that you really care about are included in your class. So this is kind of like what we usually jungle with, uh, but it's under the hood, but it shouldn't be under the hood, so I wanted to take this occasion to call it to your attention that you should always think about what class of instances my argument can deal with, okay? And it's okay if it's a small class. It's better to know that than not saying anything about this. And vice versa. You should also think about how I design an argument for some class of instances, what's possible, what's not. All right. All right, so um, one of the biggest assumptions here was that the word was just stochastic and stationary. So what if the word is not even stochastic? Can we do something with that? Uh, so there is this setting which is called the adversarial uh, bandit framework, uh, which goes like this. An adversary, uh, I just did a little devil uh, in the corner, chooses a table of payoffs for all the actions, okay? And um, this table is initially hidden. And the player goes round by round and chooses one of the actions for each of the rounds. And then the corresponding payoff from the table is revealed, okay? The agent's goal is still to maximize the total reward, uh, but that could be kind of impossible to even think about because then the adversary could say, hey, I set all the rewards to zero, good luck agent, right? That doesn't work. So it doesn't give you, uh, it doesn't give rise to any interesting strategies. So rather than doing this, we say that, well, we are already married to this concept of regret, so what if we said that the agent's goal is to minimize regret? So let's see whether how badly the adversary can push up the regret. It turns out that in this case, the adversary is going to have a much harder job. It can't just choose all the rewards to be equal to zero, because then the agent will be super happy, so regret is going to be zero. It turns out that for this type of games, the worst, the hardest instances are kind of the stochastic instances, stochastic stationary instances, right? So can we design algorithms nevertheless that uh, achieve a sublinear uh, regret, not only on the hardest instances that we were doing, but on all the instances. It turns out that you can, but the algorithms have to be changed considerably. So epsilon greedy doesn't work, UCB doesn't work. These algorithms are not hedging enough on that the word could be kind of arbitrary. They are overly confident. You need Algorithms which are less confident. One algorithm with this properties is Boltzmann exploration. I was hoping that Adam is going to talk about it. I don't know whether he mentioned it. Uh, he mentioned it a little bit, right? Uh, so that's when you take the mean payoffs for all the arms and then you are exponentiating, normalizing, creating a probability distribution that way, and you tune the learning rates in, a, in some fashion. Uh, so if you do this in a proper way, you estimate the rewards with impermanence weighting, which is related to off policy estimation, um, and you choose uh, the temperature of well, then you can get an ergotum which achieves the same worst case regret as it was possible to achieve uh, in the stochastic case. So it's kind of amazing that Boltzmann exploration does this. On the other hand, not so fast. If you, uh, so, I, okay, so adversary are problems, adversary are bandit problems. It's a larger class of uh, problems than stochastic bandit problems. 
So whatever algorithm you design for this class should at least work for the stochastic class as well. And then you can go back and then check how well Boltzmann is going to do on your stochastic instances and you will find that it's not doing very well. So here I'm showing results with some silly experiments, two arms, that is equal to 0.1, Boltzmann is way on the top. UCB is not so great. There are modern forms of UCB which are tuned to this. This is a battery bandit, so you can do better with the confidence interval designs uh, exploiting the specific form of the payoff distribution. Uh, and you can improve things by, by randomizing and, and whatnot. Uh, but there is a huge gap, right? So Boltzmann seems to be uh, paying a price uh, for being prepared to uh, build this adversary environment. Is this really necessary? It turns out that uh, the answer is no. It's, uh, you can get nearly as good performance with stochastic bandits as it was possible to get with the best stochastic algorithms. Uh, and um, at the same time, keeping all the guarantees that you have in the adversary case, and I won't have time to talk about this in the remaining 80 minutes. Uh, but this is related to uh, reinterpreting Boltzmann exploration in the context of online learning, online linear optimization, and looking at it as a KL regularized uh, optimization algorithm. So it's kind of like this is this the hint of what it does. Uh, so P is a strategy, uh, a probability distribution of reactions that it plays in a round, and uh, X is the estimated rewards. That's the importance weighted estimates for the rewards, and Boltzmann exploration can be seen to solve this, where you have, you have this KIA penalty that tells you that you should stay close to the previous strategy that you had, the previous probability distribution that you had. Okay, so that's kind of curious. Uh, but uh, it turns out that if you change the KL from, uh, it's, it's based on the neg entropy. If you change it to the Tsalis entropy regularizer, uh, then you can get best of both words. So it's kind of really neat. Uh, that in this case, things work out fine. All right, so are we done? Uh, so for the stochastic and the adversarial case, uh, we have algorithms and, and we have a single algorithm that does well in all cases. Uh, so is this all? Well, it turns out that we are still in a, in a bad state because uh, of this dependence of the number of arms. In the worst case, the regret depends with the square root of the number of arms. And this should give you a pause. Like, what if I have a thousand or a million arms? In some web applications, you would have something like that. So that means that the regret is really large. That means that you're learning very, very slowly, at least in a worst case sense. So can we do better? It turns out that uh, if you don't make any further assumptions about the environment, you can't. There's a lower bound that says that no algorithm can be better than the square root Km, all right? You have to change something. And then, okay, so here we come. Uh, we have to change some things. So how do we scale up? How do we change things? So one of the ways that people try to do this is uh, by assuming linearity, which is our, uh, our friend when it comes to uh, modeling how you can generalize from one situation to another. So uh, the so-called linear bandit framework, the way it works is that you have, again, k arms, but each arm comes with a feature vector that describes how it relates to the other arms. And you're gonna make an assumption that the payoff is related to the inner product of this feature vector with an unknown parameter vector theta star. So that's your payoff. So that's the li linearity assumption. And, uh, Usually to make this work, you would assume that the number of features, the dimensionality of the space where these feature vectors live in, is smaller than the num number of arms, okay? If this is the case, then it turns out, okay, so you can reproduce k-arm bandits by choosing unit vectors, fine. Uh, 
Well, there is the big difference at KM Bandits, before we go there, is, is that you can learn in KRM Bandits, the only way to learn about, the way and only way to learn about an arm is by trying that arm. In Wiener Bandits, if you have more correlations between the arms, then they give more information about each other. Okay, you can model content your bandits, but I'm going to just skip over that. Um, so it turns out that you can have this ergotum, which just solves least squares in every step, and generalizes this idea of optimism. So here is your confidence bond. Here is the estimate of the mean uh, payoff of arm i, and this theta parameter is just a solution of a least squares problem, where uh, you were trying in, in round t, you got this x t uh, vector, and then you got this feedback of y of t, and the y of t relates to x3, so uh, this linear relationship. So you solve this least squares problem, so that's the solution written here. You regularize a little bit, you get a confidence interval, and you choose the arm, which gives you the highest upper confidence bond. It turns out that this is still a good strategy, so this is straight uh, textbook generalization of, of UCB to the, to the linear case. And it turns out that you can get uh, good regret bonds for this case. So even if you have continuum many actions, then with this strategy, you can get d square root and regret, okay? Which is independent of the number of arms. So if, if d is much smaller than square root of k, which we had before in the regret expression, then you're winning. Sorry? What is? Oh, D. D is the dimensionality of the number of features. Yes. So the, the features for the arms were in RD. Right. Okay. So this uh, seems good. Uh, so there is mild or no dependence on k. So in the first expression, you can see k, but uh, it's, it depends, uh, the, this expression depends on k through a logarithm. So that's good. Uh, but then it turns out that the story is not so simple. So these algorithms, uh, like UCB, and tonsil sampling is, is going to be included. So I didn't talk about tonsil sampling. That is randomized ergotums. Uh, people talk a uh, lot about this tonsil sampling and graded ergotums. Basically, the idea is that you pretend that you have Bayesian, you update a posterior for the mean payoff for each of the arms, and in every round, when it comes to play, you are going to randomly choose one mean from each of the posteriors of the arms, and then you choose the arm with the highest posterior mean. It's a randomized ergotum. Uh, it sounds like uh, you're Bayesian, but you can prove frequentist guarantees for the uh, for tonsil sampling for k on bandits. For linear bandits, you have to do a little bit more work. You have to kind of uh, assume a big uh, noise variance, but it still works. Anyways, uh, the story here is, uh, is though more complicated. The story is that optimism, when you have a way of learning about one action by trying another action, is not necessarily a good idea. So here's an example. So you have uh, these two arms. So this is the optimal arm. This is a, an arm. So these are the feature vectors. So we are in R2. Uh, so I'm showing the underlying vectors. So the length of these two vectors is almost the same. And the theta vector is just aligned with this vector. So the inner product between them is the lattice possible. And the inner product between theta and, and the blue arm is, is also pretty close. And then there is the third arm, which is the other unit vector. So this is a highly suboptimal vector. It gives you zero reward. And what the optimistic algorithms do is that they keep trying the actions and they very quickly figure out a confidence ellipsoid that kind of like, you know, starts big and then shrinks and shrinks and shrinks more. And as the confidence ellipsoid that these algorithms come up with shrink, they figure out that this is a suboptimal action and they just eliminate it. And after that, these algorithms need to just use these two arms to figure out which of them is better. But that's a horrible way to, like just using these two arms will take forever to figure out which of them is better. 
because the two arms are highly correlated. Their features are very highly correlated. We know from Statistics 101 that that's a bad thing to do. You don't want to do this, but yet optimistic ergotums do this. So you have to modify the ergotums to get better regret on some instances. It turns out the regret of optimistic ergotums, no matter which one, is going to be arbitrarily larger in the large horizon case than uh, for some better designed ergotums that reason in a careful way about how you can generalize from learning about one arm to another arm. All right, I have to wrap up. Um, so, I wanted to talk a little bit about sparsity, but uh, enough to say that that's also an interesting story. Uh, sparsity is brought up when you have, you know, like a large number of features, but maybe the parameter vector is sparse, and then you want to exploit this. It turns out that in Banis, you can also exploit this to, to some extent, but it's not so simple to do and it doesn't work as well as, um, as you wish. So you can't reduce the dimension dependence as usually in supervised learning. Okay, um, so we have seen uh, these stories evolving from finite term uh, bandits to linear bandits, and we see that the choices uh, that we are making about what bandit to study does matter, uh, it's going to impact the algorithms to a large extent. Optimism is a good answer in finer term bandits. Maybe it's not an ideal answer in all problems, all bandit problems or beyond when you can generalize between actions. And that applies to reinforcement learning, by the way. So many of the advanced exploration algorithms in reinforcement learning would use uh, optimism well, optimism might be an okay strategy, but it's certainly not the best possible thing that you can do. And uh, so there's a lot of open questions, uh, a lot of things that I haven't talked about. Uh, and uh, so this is really exciting because uh, we have this smallish looking problem and yet it has a very rich structure that you can study very carefully and you can learn a lot and sometimes these lessons do generalize to more complicated settings and uh, all right uh, thank you